George's hair is too long. The famous five were strolling along Kirin Beach on a sunny August day when Julian suddenly had an idea. Let's go to Windy Cove. It's so hot on Kirin Beach. Windy Cove will be nice and cool. There's always a breeze blowing there. Right. What do you say, George? Well, Dick, I wanted to go and have my hair cut. Honestly, it will be as long as Anne's if I don't have it cut soon. Well... I wish you would have it cut. You keep on complaining about it, as if it mattered whether it was short or long. You forget that it matters to George very much. People might mistake her for a girl if it grows half an inch longer. Well, for goodness sake, George, get it cut this afternoon. We passed the hairdressers on the way to Windy Cove. We'll all go into the ice cream shop and have ices and wait for you there. <coughs> Poor old Tim. You shall have an ice cream too. They set off at two o'clock. The road to the village was hot and dusty, and Timmy ran with his long pink tongue hanging halfway down his front legs. They came to the village, and George went to the hairdresser's shop, while the others went on with Timmy to the dairy, which sold good, creamy ices. They heard George calling to them, and turned. The shop's shut! It's early closing day. Oh, blow. I forgot. Now I can't have my hair cut. Well, never mind. Come and have an ice cream. No, I want to have my hair cut, even if I have to cut it myself. Anybody got a pair of scissors? Of course not. Who carries scissors about? Don't be an idiot, George. For goodness sake, come on with us and stop worrying about your hair. I shall go and borrow some scissors in the ironmongers. Oh, they're shut too. But I know old Mr. Pales will let me in at the side door. You go on with Timmy and have ice creams. I don't want one. I'll catch you up when I'm ready. What a fat head George is. Once she's made up her mind to do something, nothing will stop her. Not even if it doesn't really matter. While they went to the dairy... George went round to the side door of the ironmonger's shop. Mr. Pales answered her knock. Oh, well, Miss George, what do you want? My shop's shut, as you very well know. I'm just going to catch the bus over to my son's, as I always do on early closing day. I won't keep you more than a minute. I want to borrow a pair of nice sharp scissors, Mr. Pales. Only just for a minute or two. The bus doesn't go for ten minutes. You've got plenty of time. Oh, well, well. You always were one for getting your own way. <laughs> oh, come along, Enoch. I'll show you the drawer where the scissors are kept. But don't you be long now. I must catch that bus. George went down the passage that led to the shop, and the old fellow took her to a drawer at the back. He was just opening it when a small van drew up outside. Two men got out. George looked up casually and jumped. One of the men was peering through the letterbox on the shop door. What an extraordinary thing to do! George distinctly saw the man's eyes looking through the letterbox into the dark shop. She pulled at Mr. Pale's arm and whispered, Do you see that man peering through the letterbox? What does he want? He couldn't have seen us because we're in such a dark corner. At that very moment, the door was forced open and the two men came hurriedly into the shop. At first they didn't see Mr. Pales and George and made for the little black safe at the back of the counter. Mr. Pales gave an indignant shout. Hey, you! What do you mean forcing your way in here? I'll... But one of the men leapt over to him and put his hand over the old fellow's mouth. The other man ran to George and swung her into a little cupboard nearby, paying no attention to her yells. Mr. Pales was shoved in too, and the door was forced shut on them and locked. Help! Help! Please, someone let us out! Help! We're in the cupboard! Help! Help! 
George shouted at the top of her voice, and so did Mr. Pales. But the shop was set apart from the others in the street, and there was no one to hear them on that hot, stifling afternoon. George heard the sound of panting as the men removed the heavy little safe. Then the shop door was shut, and there was the sound of the van being started up and driven away. Oh, if only I had Timmy with me! Why did I say he could go and have an ice cream with the others? Mr. Pales was almost fainting with shock and fright, and was no help at all. George gave up struggling with the door after a time, and began to wish there were not so many pans and brushes stored in the cupboard, leaving so little room for her and the old ironmonger. She wondered what the others were doing. Would they come back and look for her? If they did, she could yell again. But the others had now finished their ice creams, and were on the way to Windy Cove. George had said she didn't want an ice cream, and would catch them up. Very well, they would walk on, and she could overtake them. So off they went along the road that led to Windy Cove, Timmy lagging a little on the lookout for his beloved George. Why didn't she come? He suddenly decided to go back and look for her. He felt anxious, though he didn't know why. He turned tail and trotted off back to the village. <laughs> there goes Tim. He can't bear to be without George for more than half an hour. Goodbye, Tim. Tell George to hurry up. They went on their way without Timmy, walking in a line across the narrow lane. Suddenly a van turned a corner behind them and came racing up at top speed. Look out, Anne! Oh, thanks, Dick. You saved my life. What does the driver think he's doing? Tearing down narrow, winding lanes like that. What's his hurry? That sounded like a burst tyre. I hope they haven't had an accident. Come on, hurry! The three turned the corner. They saw the van slewed round in the lane, almost in the ditch. The tyre on the left-hand back wheel was flat and had split badly. It certainly was a very burst tyre indeed. Two men were looking at it angrily. Here you, run to the nearest garage, will you? Ask a man to come and help us. Certainly not. You nearly knocked my sister over just now. One of you can go and get help yourselves. You've no business to drive along a country lane like that. Clear off then, unless you want to help us with the wheel. Do you know how to change a wheel? Yes. Don't you? It's funny if you don't know. As your job is driving a van, I should have thought it would be one of the first things you'd learn. You shut up and clear off. Why? You seem very anxious to get rid of us, don't you? Or do you feel nervous that experts like us should watch you making a mess of such a simple thing as changing a wheel? I think I'll go back and meet George. Anne walked round the van. She took a quick look inside and saw a little black safe there. A safe? She took a quick glance back at the two men. They were certainly a nasty-looking couple. She went over to Julian and sat down beside him. She took a twig and began to write idly in the thick dust at their feet, nudging him as she did so. Julian looked down into the dust at once. A safe is in the van. Anne had written in the dust, and as soon as she knew the boys had seen what she had written, she rubbed her foot over the hurried writing. The three stared at the two men, who were now trying to change the wheel. It was plain that they had never changed one before. Julian caught hold of Anne when she got up to go and meet George. George may have changed her mind and gone home. You stay with us, Anne. So Anne stayed hoping against hope that George would soon appear with Timmy. Why was she so long? She must have gone home, after all. What was Julian going to do? Wait for another car to come along and then stop it and pass his suspicions to the driver? 
because the whole thing was very suspicious. Anne was certain that both the safe and van were stolen. Where was George? She'd had plenty of time to borrow scissors, cut her hair and catch them up. Poor George had stood in the cupboard till she was so cramped she could hardly move an arm or a leg. Mr. Pale seemed to have fainted, but she couldn't do anything about it. And then she heard a most familiar and welcome sound. Feet pattered down the passage that led to the back of the shop, and then came a whine. <coughs> Timmy! Timmy! Tim! I'm here, in this cupboard! Timmy! A passer-by heard the barking and stopped in surprise. He pushed open the door which had been left unlocked by the two thieves and looked inside. He saw Timmy by the cupboard door. Anyone here? Yes! Yes! We're locked in this cupboard! Let us out, please! Oh, thank you. Good boy, Timmy. Oh, poor old Mr. Pales. Let me give you a hand. Police! Police! Yeah, I'll send someone for the police and a doctor too. You sit down in that chair, Mr. Pales. I'll look after you. George slipped out of the shop. She felt rather faint after her long stay in the cramped cupboard. She must hurry after the others, tell them what's happened and get them back to the shop. It was no use going to Windy Cove that afternoon. So she and Timmy hurried down the dusty lane that led from the village to Windy Cove. How far had the others got? Perhaps they were at the cove now. But they were not. They were still sitting at the side of the lane watching the two perspiring, harassed, fumbling men trying to put on a second wheel after having spent ages getting the first one off. There were not enough tools to do the job properly, as Julian could very well see. He wished George would come. Timmy would be such a help. And then, round the corner came George at last, with Timmy at her heels. Rather a pale George, evidently bursting with news. She raced up to them. Jim, Dick, what do you think happened to me? Mr. Pales and I were locked in a cupboard in his shop by two thieves who... Why, those are the two men. And that's the van they came in. Have they got a safe in it? Yes, they have. Are you sure you recognise these two men, George? Oh, yes. I'll never forget them as long as I live. Timmy, watch them. Watch them, Timmy. Timmy sprang over to the two men growling so fiercely and showing all his fine teeth in such a snarl that the two men shrank back terrified. One raised a hand as if to strike Timmy with the tool he held. If you hit him, he'll have you down on the ground at once. Now, what do we do, Julian? These men ought to be handed over to the police. Listen, here comes the car. We can stop it and send a message to the village. A big car came round the corner from the direction of Windy Cove. Julian waved to it to stop. Two men were in it. Julian explained as shortly as he could. One of the men jumped out immediately. Right. You want the police at once. Let's put that wheel on the van and take the two men back to Kiran village in it. You can drive it and the boy with the dog can go too. We'll put him in the van with the two men. You others, get into my car and we'll follow the van back to Kiran and get the police. This all sounded very sane and sensible. The wheel was put on in a jiffy, the two men bundled into the back with a snarling Timmy, and George, pleased because she had been mistaken for a boy, sat in the front of the van with the passenger from the other car. They drove off, followed by the big car, in which were a pleased and smiling Julian, Dick and Anne. It was very exciting when they all got to Kirin village. The police were amazed and delighted to have the two robbers delivered to them, with the safe and the stolen van as well. 
Mr. Pales was very, very grateful. Timmy was half sorry he hadn't been allowed even a small bite, but extremely happy to have been able to rescue his beloved George. They arrived home at last and told George's mother their astonishing tale. Well, what a thrill! So you didn't get to Windy Cove after all. Still, you can all go tomorrow. I can't. Why? Why? Because I simply must get my hair cut. And I'll jolly well see I'm not locked in a cupboard next time. <laughs> <laughs>